Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back here on my channel today with RTX 3080 content finally. I think yesterday everything was released when it comes to the founders edition all the benchmarks should be out therefore you should also be able to know what kind of performance you can expect from RTX 3080. This also means that I'm not going to waste my time with a lot of gaming benchmarks you can certainly find them on a ton of other YouTube channels. What we're going to do in today's video is take apart this Asus RTX Tough Gaming RTX 3080 in the OC version which means that it has a slightly higher boost clock of 1815 megahertz that's about yeah 100 megahertz above the stock boost and that's certainly a lot and should help in performance but today we will take a closer look at this thing check out how is the cooling of this card what makes this card maybe special and also if we can do shunt mods I ordered some shunt resistors and I didn't take the card apart yet, which means I'm not 100% sure how the power supply is designed on this card and we will find this out together and see if we can do some shunt mods and then see what this card got. Design-wise, the RTX 3080 Tough Gaming reminds me of previous products. It doesn't matter if it's a main board or a previous generation graphics card, they all pretty much have the same design. But a cool enhancement is that, you can hear it, this is aluminium. It's not plastic anymore, which makes it feel a lot more high quality. We have three big fans and just judging by the fan design or the fan blade direction, you can also judge in which direction the fans are spinning. Counterclockwise, those two and this one clockwise, that's for best cooling and also to reduce noise. On the front side, you can spot two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors and underneath there's a small display this area right here can be controlled with the ASUS software to change it with RGB. That's cool if you want RGB, but otherwise there is not much RGB on this card, which I think is also quite cool. You can see a lot of fins right here. And I'm curious how the cooler will look like underneath. Similar to all the other RTX 3080 and 3090 cards, I think all of them have those features that there is a cutout in the back. It's not really a cutout because the PCB just ends somewhere here, which we will see once we remove the backplate of the card. And because the PCB is a little bit shorter and the cooler is longer, it's just extended and this allows the fan to blow directly through this cutout in the card which makes cooling a little bit more efficient and a bit, little bit better than just having to squeeze out the air to the side of the card which is what's happening at the other areas of the card and i think you're probably all familiar with this feature on those cards already on top there is also a switch and with this switch you can change bios from quiet to performance mode change the fan profile and also the boost clock of the card something we're going to check in a second. If you remember the NVIDIA presentation, you might remember a part where they were speaking about this spring on the back, which allows higher mounting pressure and more equal mounting pressure of the cooler to the GPU and, the, and then also across the PCB itself. Apparently this is a new feature. I'm not sure why my 3870X2 from like 10 years ago has the same thing. Now we can spot one of the, in my opinion, more interesting features of the design of this tough gaming card and that is this modular cooler design. We took off the massive cooling block which we, which we will check out in a second but now we have this other cooling block which is still sitting on the card. You can see there is a heat pipe going from the left part where we have power stages sitting underneath to this top of block where we have a huge fin stack. We have another fin stack here and here and those fin stacks will get direct air from the fan which is sitting above and this modular small cooler is responsible for cooling the front part of the MOSFETs and the surrounding memory chips which are sitting right here. On the back we have another huge lineup of MOSFETs and those will get direct contact from the cooling block sitting above. The thermal pads on this card are not that convenient for removing the cooler and putting it back. If I just scrape it off with my iFixit tool it kind of works but 
Otherwise, if you just take it like that and try to remove it as you would usually do it, it just falls apart. It doesn't feel like a normal thermal pad, it feels a little bit more like paste, like a thicker paste which will make it a little bit more difficult removing those blocks and putting them back. Quick overview over the block. Contact for the GPU, obviously we have six heat pipes in total. Contact area for inductors, power stages in the back for the back side of the card. Here we have our frame, which we previously had sitting on the card. It's now removed. There is an additional thermal pad right here. And normally this frame is just sitting here on the cooler and over this additional thermal pad down there also making contact with the big block and also with the heat pipes directly can be utilized for dissipating additional heat through this piece of copper with the thermal pad attached finally also removed the backplate from the card backplate is making contact with the back of the memory sticks with additional thick and sticky thermal pads we also have additional thick and sticky thermal pads making contact with the capacitors on the back on the card would probably be better to have them sitting right here where they could make contact with the back of the power stages but i think asus probably tested this and Maybe this was the best position or just to keep space between the capacitors and the backplate. Backplate will not do that much for cooling, but it will certainly also help mechanical stability. It's quite thick and will be mounted and screwed directly to the cooler. Spent last night investigating the card more in detail and the more I investigated, the more I absolutely liked the design. I will just show you close up what I mean in detail. Starting off with some words on the voltage supply, a massive stack on the right, massive stack on the left. You see some of the inductors I have marked with M. The one here on the top, on the bottom, first one here and the fourth from the bottom on the left side. Those are for memory voltage supply, which is a little bit unusual. Usually you would have like four in a row, but here they are spread within the GPU voltage supply. All the others non-marked inductors are for GPU voltage supply, which is definitely quite a lot. In result, we have four phases for memory supply and we have 16 phases for GPU voltage supply. The one on the top left right here is for PEX voltage. Bottom left right here is 1.8 volt supply. Couldn't figure out this one and this one yet. Could be like 3.3 volt or 5 volt. But um, yeah, it's just easier if I measure this once it's enabled, once the card is running. Bottom left, we also have a shunt resistor measuring the power coming from the PCI Express connector. And the top right, we have a ton of shunt resistors, which will be interesting, I think. For whatever reason, we have five shunt resistors on this card in total. The top left is connected to this 8-pin and the top right is connected to this 8-pin. That would be the traditional power measurement. Just the voltage drop across this resistor calculated with the resistance of 5 milliohm. Then you can get the power consumption of this connector and this connector. This shunt resistor right here is connected with the one on top and those two are connected with this one. I'm not sure what the reason for the th three additional ones on the bottom is, but we will try to figure that out. Voltage controller is UP9512, should be the same as on the 2080 Ti, that's the one sitting right here. Interesting is the PGS-CON1 connector right here, three pin connector where we could attach an Elmo EVC for voltage supply or voltage regulation on the card, but that will be for a separate video. I was just telling you that I found out some more interesting features about this card which I didn't spot at the first second and that's voltage measurement points for every single important voltage. That is amazing. For example MSVDD on the bottom left right here that is part of the memory voltage supply. The real memory voltage, top right, PAX voltage, 12 volt, 1.8 volt, 3.3 volt, another 12 volt right here, 5 volt and also GPU voltage on the top left. That is amazing that this card has all the important voltages marked on the back with specific probing points. That is a very, very cool feature. Card is sitting on my bench meanwhile, just running my tests. And if I just keep my mouth shut, yeah, you can't really hear anything. I'm just running the quiet profile for now and it's living up to its name. The quiet profile is absolutely quiet. I cannot hear the fans at all, that is perfect. By the way, the card is also semi-passive, which means that below 50 or 55 degrees Celsius, the fans won't spin at all. When you're just sitting in desktop, this will be perfect. And once you're doing your 3D load, which I'm just doing right now with 
running 3D mic time spy in a looped process. Yeah, the fans are spinning, but they're spinning slow. They're not annoying. The only thing I have to highlight is I can hear a little bit of coil whine. Quick look into GPU-Z and GPU-Z changed a lot compared to the previous version. First, quick look on the frequency, temperature and also fan speed. On my card, the GPU is pretty much sitting always above 1900 MHz, which is more than the Quiet Profile should have, but that means I have a very good GPU on my card. That is nice. Temperature-wise, always around 70 degrees Celsius, fan speed about 1500 RPM, which is about 66%, which also means that there is some headroom if you're running this card in a very bad ventilated case. The part on the bottom end GPU-Z is the very interesting part in the RTX 3000 series. We can now get a very detailed overview of the power consumption of this card and how it's monitored. That is extremely interesting. First of all, power consumption right now about 100% TDP, which equals about 340 to 350 watt board power draw, which you can see on top right here. And then we have the GPU chip power draw, which seems to be only 190 watt and then memory power draw 60 watt power SRC I'm not quite sure what this is and we have 80 watt right here but then the more interesting part especially for shunt modding is that we can see first 8 pin power supply has 150 watt power draw second one has 130 to 140 watt power draw and then we have about 50 watt over the PCI Express slot those readings are extremely helpful for shunt modding but first of all, switching over to the performance BIOS profile to see what kind of change we can get in the frequency. Switch to performance profile, there is not a big difference. Maximum 10 MHz, but looks pretty much the same. Now 1950 megahertz on the GPU, which looks quite a lot. It's much more than what ASUS promised. Therefore, I'm not going to complain. Fan speed is pretty much the same as before, still 1500 RPM. And in result, also the noise is the same. Spent some time trying to overclock this thing. And the only thing I could pretty much do was overclocking the GPU manually by plus 80 megahertz on the GPU. If I go to plus 100, it starts crashing in times by extreme. This setting right now is almost 2 GHz on the GPU, we are very close, sometimes like 1995 MHz right here, that is pretty close to the 2 GHz mark, but if I change the power target, I already adjusted it to 100%, 110% I mean, on the bottom right in GPU-C, it's still only reading 100%. Which means adjusting the power target in GPU tweak doesn't do anything. Time to do the hard mode, I guess. As usual, the shunt resistors are located directly underneath the power connectors. We have five of them in total right here. They are labeled with R005, which means that they have a resistance of 5 milliohm. Quick recap on the shunt resistor topic. I know most of you should be very familiar with this topic, but the way it works is we have those resistors sitting directly underneath the power connector and there is a small IC which has stored the resistance value inside. The IC knows we have a resistor of 5 milliohm. Now, for example, we would assume that we have 12 amps running through the 8 pin connector with the voltage of 12 volt. It would result in a power consumption of 144 watt across this single connector. And now if we take a different shunt resistor, for example, 3 milliohm or 2.5 milliohm, 2.5 milliohm is something we can do very easily because I just have an additional 5 milliohm shunt resistor which we can solder on top and the resulting resistance of two parallel resistors with the same size is the half and this would equal that we cut the measured power consumption in half. For example, as I said before, if we have those 144 watt measured power consumption then there is a voltage measured across this resistor which is 30 millivolt and we're just simply changing this very tiny voltage by adding an additional resistor. card is already up and running also attached my current clamp just to keep track of the current i would say like 0.5 amps more than previously just added it to keep track because we obviously cannot measure the real 
yeah, value right now with the modded shunt resistor. And now you can see the result of the shunt mod and that's mainly you have a more stable frequency curve. Just checking out this area right here. It's pretty stable somewhere at 1965, 1980, 1950 maybe. And that is an increase of about 30 to 40 megahertz, which is not really that much. GPU temperature, also fan speed is pretty much the same. Fan speed is slightly increased because we have a slightly higher power consumption than before. That makes absolute sense. Board power draw now dropped. It should be at a region of 360, maybe 370 watt, but it's only reading 275 watt because of the shunt mod. And in the region down below, you can see power consumption is now reading only 80% TDP, which is pretty much perfect. 8 pin number 2 power connector is also reading only 70 watt. That is the one we cut in half, previously reading about 140 watt, now only about 70 watt. How does this translate into performance? I did some times by extreme GT1 testing. Stock I had 57.8 FPS and with the shunt resistor 59.07 FPS, about 1.2 FPS increase, about 2%. Not that much, but usually you would do such a shunt mod for extreme overclocking, dry ice, liquid nitrogen, anything where you also have to increase the voltage. Something we couldn't or didn't do right now, but something we can do in the future. We will cover that in an additional video simply because it's now 11 p.m. for me and tomorrow 3 p.m. this video has to be online and I don't really have much time anymore to do any testing. That's why we have to end this video for now, but we will do a second video with more coverage of 3080, 3090s. And uh, yeah, thanks to Nvidia for giving us uh, so much time with, that, with those cards. That's absolutely great. I I know that, for example, there are 3090 samples waiting for me. They're sitting in warehouses, but Nvidia is not allowing partners to ship it out to us. And it's just taking away time. And then I have to sit here again three days in a row, sleeping like four hours a day. And yeah, thanks for that. Otherwise, um, when it comes to the tough gaming 3080, I'm very satisfied with this card. The cooler is great. Very nice design. It's pretty quiet. I would put this into my case any day. The only thing which was a little bit annoying was coil wine, which I could slightly hear because the cooler is so quiet. I couldn't find any difference between performance mode and quiet mode when it comes to the BIOS because in both BIOS versions I had a massive boost which was higher than anything that ASUS promised when you're buying the card and not going to complain about always having like 1950 megahertz absolutely uh, great values obviously could be my individual gpu not saying that all of those gpus will be this great i also loved the measurement points on the back side the coolers design itself and the only thing i disliked slightly was the thermal pad design just because if you take off the cooler you're ripping apart the thermal pads if you only get it for gaming it will never be a concern for you but for me if i take apart the cooler like two or three to four times you just completely rip apart those thermal pads and it's pretty hard to get them back on the other hand this type of thermal pad is also usually a little bit better conductive like thermally conductive that's probably the reason why they decided to go for these we will do more videos on 3080 3090 of course once we have the time thanks for tuning in see you next time bye